Um, welcome. We're glad you're here. I'm Pat Miles. I'm president of the board of uh, the, uh, the Friends of the Library Board. So tonight, we are pleased to have Jason Anderson here. He came to speak to us in October of last year to see if we could help by supporting him through being a fiduciary agent with the Wayne County Community Foundation, and we agreed to do so. So uh, I know Jason will tell you a lot more about what he's doing, but um, these are just a few of the ways we do support the library and the staff. All right, well, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for being here on a Tuesday evening. This year's evening. Yeah, I'm a teacher, and uh, this is a crazy week. So we can go back tomorrow night, and we'll repeat the same thing. <laughs> uh, my name is Jason Anderson. I have lived in Worcester almost all of my life. Uh, I am a high school history teacher. I'm in charge of the Social Studies Department at Archbishop Pulpit High School in Akron, where I, for the past 20 years, have taught U.S. history, uh, AP U.S. history. I teach a Mysteries of the Ancient World class. I teach an archaeology class, I teach honors government, I teach a whole assortment of really, really cool courses as well as a museum studies class. Uh, my archaeology class just returned a week and a half ago from our eighth trip to Mount Vernon. Uh, we are the only school to have the opportunity, I'm very, very proud of this, to excavate with the professional staff at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, so being at Mount Vernon, I've done a lot of work there as a teacher. I go there every summer to help teachers learn about Washington, how do you include Washington in the classroom, keep the memory of the revolution and the 18th century alive, how does it relate to students in the 21st century? And that's a big challenge. And every year we find new and new and exciting ways of doing that. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this, I found myself digging through some old research that I had started to compile about 12 years ago on Major General David Worcester. And if any of you remember the old Jay Leno uh, shows at night, he would go out in the street and you would ask somebody, so who is General Worcester? Exactly. And who is General Worcester? Uh, and, and that's what you would have ended up with. And I got to tell you what, this is the 21st lecture I've given on General Worcester, and they're still pulling chairs down. So this is awesome. I mean, uh, there was a little bit of a concern. In 2021, 20, no one's going to show up. There's, they've all heard this before. And the room is almost full to capacity. And the back row keeps getting bigger and bigger. And this says a lot about us. We have an innate need. We want to know, who is this man? Who is the man that Revolutionary War veterans who came to the Ohio Territory after the Revolution, 32 years after his death, honor this man by naming this city the county seat for this county in his honor. So who is this man who never, ever set foot anywhere in Ohio? I don't know about you, but I always ask this. Think of somebody 32 years ago that made such an impact in your life, individually, that without hesitation, if an opportunity arose to honor this person, by naming something after them, it's not just one of you, but many of you would agree to the same person. I think we would be really hard pressed in this room right now today to come up with a majority of somebody's that we would all agree to, to name something after whoever this person would be. But these men in the early 1800s who came here did not hesitate. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with Worcester's legacy towards the end of this. If you take a look at this, you'll see that Worcester was born in 1710 or 1711. We're not 100% sure, but it really, really looks more towards the 1710 portion of that. That means, it's very exciting to me, that means next year will be the 310th anniversary, <laughs> now I'm teaching that, of the birth <laughs> of General David Worcester. I cannot think of any more excellent time to have our statue dedicated when it is the 310th anniversary of this man's birth in Connecticut. So let's keep going with that. You see the images here, the images we see of General Worcester, those of you that remember going to the old Perkins or the old coffee house up on Cleveland Road, 
remember seeing the image of just the face, neat little painting. As a child, my parents who are here, go along there, wave your hands, please. They're responsible for all of this. <laughs> and they wouldn't change any, any of it. Um, my parents would take me there, and I was fascinated by this portrait. And that's all you ever saw was just the headshot of this soldier. And then when the, the place closed down, it went up for auction. I tried to get it, but it didn't work out so well. But I know where it's at, so that's okay. <laughs> so the more I was enamored by this man, who is this guy? Nobody knows. I start reading about him. And I hear the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's almost like one historian wrote one line, and they just parroted it everywhere. David Worcester was an old crotchety curmudgeon who didn't listen to orders, and nobody liked him. And he says it over and over again. I'm like, okay, I need to, let's dig into this. Who is this old crotchety curmudgeon that nobody liked? Says Benedict Arnold. Okay, that's got my attention. Says Philip Schuyler. Anybody related to him in this room, by the way? Because I'm going to go on a tirade about him. <laughs> Philip Schuyler is a political general. And Worcester was his senior. And Worcester was in his way. Arnold was 35 years younger. So those of you with age, wisdom, and experience in this room know exactly what that's like when someone is much younger, thinks they know everything, and that old crotchy curmudgeon is in their way. Okay, so I read these things. I'm like, who is this man? But our city's named for this guy. They're not going to name the city, I hoped anyway, after somebody who's just a, a goof. So I start researching. And it's really hard. Because after the revolution, in the midst of the revolution, then, then later afterwards, all of David Worcester's personal effects are destroyed. So putting his biography together is like a massive puzzle <coughs> with half the pieces missing. Because I have to assume that if he wrote to Washington, then Washington kept Worcester's letter and a copy of Washington's reply, which Washington did. So now I've got to find who these people were they would have written to, the governors of Connecticut. So we go on and on, and what you're going to see here tonight is a culmination of about 15 years' worth of research, but you're never quite done. I'm extremely excited because just this summer, with more and more archives being digitized, I ran across 76 new letters that have not been seen. Two of them you'll see up here, which are phenomenally awesome. All right? Um, there was one from 1761. I'm looking at this letter, I'm like, oh, this is really cool. It's not up here, but this one's cool. Where his signature is with seven other officers congratulating <coughs> is newly crowned Britannic Majesty, King George III, for taking over on his grandfather's death. And his name's on this. So it really makes you think, who, who is this guy? Because this guy in this picture, this isn't a Revolutionary War picture. This picture is of David Worcester in 1746 in his British officer's uniform. Now what really gets confusing is when you look at this portrait, and if you look at it closely, it will say the commander in chief of the provincial army against Quebec, 1776. This is a stock picture done 30 years later. <laughs> and now that we're at war with England, and England says, you know what, we did a picture of that guy once. Where is that? Oh, here it is. Let's reprint it and mark it for what he's doing now in 1776. So you'll see that that's the only image of him ever done. We'll talk about this just <laughs> These other ones are all caricatures. You did one, and I'm going to take a little bit of one, I'm going to redo my own, I'm going to colorize a version, I'm going to put one in a coffee shop <laughs> on Cleveland Road. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Now, when digging through Worcester's letters, I'll be really honest with you, I'm really enamored by this man. To me, David Worcester is an American hero. I hold George Washington. Way up here. David Worcester, look at man. I hold at a level, level playing field with a Washington. And you'll see why in just a minute. So as I dig through his letters, I'm trying to find always one of those good quotes. What is, a, what is a quote that really says something about Worcester? And this is a letter that he writes to John Hancock. And by the way, in June of 76, we'll get to this in a minute. Remember this date in a minute. So think about what he's saying here. The honor of a soldier being the first thing he should have fed, and his honesty 
the last that he should give up. His character must ever be considered as entitled to the protection of the virtuous and the good. Honor, honesty, character. This is our name. And this is written at a very, very low end in Worcester's military career. Now, let's take a look at this. When I talk about David Worcester to my class, or I talk about Washington, the only way to make this person applicable to anybody in 2019, how old are you, young man? What grade are you? Can you relate to this guy at all? No, you can't. And, and, and I want to know in a minute, you play soccer? Are you athletic? You play sports? What do you play? Baseball. Okay, so you're athletic. You like getting out and doing things? So do he. All right? When we're done with this conversation, you and I are going to have a little chat. And I want you to tell me how much you think this guy's cool because you can relate to him. Okay? <laughs> so anytime you look at this, you've got to make it applicable. Not make it, you got to make sure that the young people, especially your students, relate to this guy. So who is this? Now, some of these they're not going to relate to, but we can. So how do you make this man come to life? He's a husband. And he's a father. So most of us are, are <laughs> married. Most of us in this room probably have children. So we can relate to the fact that, okay, while he's off doing all of these things, his wife is at home. And his six children are at home. So I'm off doing my thing, not too far from home. Wife's at home, kids are there, everything okay, because I've got, got one foot in the door, one foot on the, in, the, in the stirrup. i got to make sure that you're okay. And he does. He marries the daughter of the president of Yale. That's a pretty good connection. And that, you know, he's also very educated. So let's take a look at this. He's also an entrepreneur. David Wooster, he becomes a lawyer, graduates from Yale University at the time. His father-in-law is the president of Yale. Wooster actually held most of the Yale historical records at the time when all of his stuff was destroyed. He founds a mercantile company, the David Wooster & Company, and it is a very, very, very profitable business in New Haven, Connecticut. He is going to fund this long war. And I tell my students, this is the equivalent of owning UPS. If you can have a long wharf coming into New Haven, guess what you now bypass? You bypass New York Park. And you become a very profitable city. And that's what he does. He funds this. Okay? During the Revolutionary War, this is very sad. He and a few others privately put forth the cash to feed, clothe, and outfit the Connecticut soldiers. Those receipts are destroyed. Guess who can never get reimbursed for the personal funds laid down during the war? His wife. Okay? He is also a Mason. He establishes the first Freemasonry Lodge in Connecticut in 1750. He's a soldier. I mean, we predominantly know this man as a soldier. He's doing all of these things, and he's in the War of Jane Kazir, the Siege of Lewisburg, the French and Indian War, and the American Revolution. He is in the military over 40 years of his life. Active. This is not, I'm on a parade ground. I'm out in the middle of nowhere kind of soldier. And we'll get to that in a minute. This is awesome. He's also a civic leader. He is constantly writing to all of the governors of, of Connecticut, and they respond to him. And what's even very, very, I think, cooler than this, look at this last bit, because everybody asks me, especially earlier this year, they're kind of getting used to this now, but I want them to ask me, what's the question? Ask me the question. Did David Worcester, oh, I know some of that, just itch and ask him. Did David Worcester own slaves? Huh? Huh? Because Washington did. David Worcester did not. And let me go even one step further, because I think this is so powerful to indicate. <clears throat> we have, and this, these are two of the letters I found this summer. I knew the letter, but I actually got to see the original copies. In 1773, Phyllis Wheatley, the very first, and I, I, I apologize, I kind of tripled myself with this, freed black woman in Boston, and she's a poet. She writes him in 1773 from England. She just got her freedom. Her poetry book is just getting ready to publish. And this isn't like, oh, dear sir, I don't know you, but can you? this is very cordial. They know each other. They have written to each other before. She asks him two things. Would you please buy a subscription to my new poetry book? 
which is being published this year in England. And please, talk to your printer friends in Connecticut. Do not let them print it on their own and make money. I am a single black woman, and this is my only means of income. And David Worcester fulfills both of those. When David Worcester dies in 1777, Phyllis Wheatley writes to his wife, the spring later, a heart-wrenching letter of sympathy and sorrow filled with a two-page eulogy poem to the honor of David Worcester. So this guy, this, okay, I'm, I'm, are you ready? Are you ready? All right, let's keep going. All right, let's take a look at where he is as a soldier. So David Worcester is active all over the place, and at a very young age. So early on, after he graduates in 1738, uh, he's already engaged in the War of Jenkins' Ear. <laughs> I don't know if you know much about the War of Jenkins' Ear. This is a really odd kind of war, but it really fits the era. Jenkins is a British captain who appears to part of it that his ship has been savagely attacked by Spaniards. And just to prove it, he shows this pickle jar with this nasty looking thing in it that looks like supposed to be an ear. Okay, now this is the era where men don't wear wigs like this yet. They were the really long, <coughs> full ones. No one ever asked, I'm sorry, Mr. Jenkins, can I just, do you, are you that? No one ever checked. I don't mean to make fun of it, but this was enough to, you know, my honor has been infringed upon against the Spanish, we're going to war. Because the Sugar Islands and the Caribbean were very profitable. So in Connecticut, Connecticut, way up here, how does this impact those in Connecticut? The Connecticut General Assembly uh, had a sloop of war bill called the Defense, and David Worcester is first commissioned as a lieutenant of this, and then commands it. And his only job is to sail up and down the coast. He goes down about as far as Virginia, the Chesapeake, and back to patrol for Spanish pirates. And there aren't any. But they're prepared just in case. So there is his experience militarily, the first one, War of Jenkins. Here. Let's follow this up then with the production of Lewisburg, which we'll get to in just a second. Lewisburg's way up here, which is the bottleneck cork. If you want to get the French trapped at Quebec and Montreal, you capture Lewisburg, and Worcester does. He's involved in the French and Indian War here at Fort Ticonderoga. I cannot stress to you enough how crucially important that is for us and for him. And then all of the black little stars here are where we're going to see David Worcester during the American Revolution. So let's take a look at the Siege of Lewisburg. All right? At the Siege of Lewisburg, what do we have? I love playing music when I give presentations, especially my students. They're going to hear this and say, why are this in my country too? And I cut them off and said, it's not my country too. This God save the king. These are the songs that David Worcester would have known, especially as a British subject. In, before the revolution, and even after the revolution. So if he's at Lewisburg as a British soldier, you better believe the hat is off, the sword is out, God save the king. So these are things that really you know, get our students involved in music, images. So what about Lewisburg? So let me go back here just a second. If you take a look here, Lewisburg is way, way up here. Here's the map of the fort. In 1745, this is the first letter that we actually have in David Worcester's handwriting. And I'm not going to read these to you, but this one's kind of cool, so I will, I will read this one. Uh, so New Haven, April 2nd, 1745, this is written to the governor of Connecticut. May it please your honor, I have completed my company and am ready to proceed as soon as I have orders, but I want a great many guns and have no press warrant. I cannot get them. Therefore, I desire your honor to favor me with a press warrant for whatsoever I shall want for the expedition. This from your honor's very humble servant, to command David Worcester. What's really cool about this is you look at his signature. This is the earliest copy we see of his handwriting. And his D's swoop back so you see command David. And it's really kind of neat to start pulling apart these handwritten letters. And what's really scary, young man, can you read cursive writing? Are you taught cursive writing? All right, we're going to have no chat. Everybody's talking. <laughs> um, on a serious note, if we don't teach cursive writing, we will very soon have generations that can never ever read the founding documents in their own hands. I mean, think about that. There was a point, and I don't mean to get conspiratorial, there was a point where the Egyptians could no longer read hieroglyphics. I'm just saying, this is important stuff. So, did anybody know what a press warrant is, by the way? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I need a press warrant. It's a kind of legal, I'm taking your stuff kind of piece of paper. So without that legal, I want your stuff to take a piece of paper, I can't get the guns I need to go up to Lewisburg. What is interesting though in Lewisburg, and this is awesome, so awesome, are you ready for this? George Washington gets very jealous if he knew this. Okay, look at what he gets. After he is at Lewisburg, he plays a crucial role with Connecticut troops capturing this French fort. All right? So at the end of the, the siege of Lewisburg, I don't know if it's a punishment or if it was a privilege, but he was in charge of the French prison ship going back to Paris. So he takes the French prisoners back to Paris. The French, understandably, don't let him off the boat. We'll take our guys, but you Englishmen, you know, you stay right there. And he goes to England, where he is asked to meet his royal Britannic majesty King George II, who does not read, write, or speak English, nor did George I. These were Germanic kings from Hanover. He meet, the king wants to meet this continental, this colonial, okay? And look at what happens. Number one, he has his portrait made. That's the image that we have here. This is David Wooster in front of the walls of Lewisburg, not Quebec, as it says here in 1776. This is him from Lewisburg. He has given 3,000 acres of land in New York. That's a lot of land. Which unfortunately later in life, if you look at the timeline, he has to sell. Because his oldest son is in debtor's prison in Ireland. And the only way to get him out is to sell the land in New York, take the cash, and get his kid out of jail. But the third part, and I ask historians all the time, I'm out for, I mean, with historians and authors and scholars among scholars. Do you know of any colonial who was ever given a royal commission as an officer in a British regiment ever? I'm not talking lieutenant down, I'm talking captain up. No. 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 David Worcester as far as all of our research shows, is the only colonial ever to be given the captaincy of a British Royal Regiment. What that means is while the 53rd Regiment of Foot under Colonel Sir William Pepperell is in the field, he gets full pay for life. Full pay. When they're not fighting, he is half paid for life. So consider this guy's a lawyer, half paid for life, he's a merchant, they got that long war thing going, He's pretty well set. Keep that in mind, okay? This is awesome. George Washington, I truly believe this. Had he been given an officer's position in the British Army, which he desperately wanted, we would never hear about him, except for one of those guys in red. Worcester gets that, but he doesn't put the red on. So, let's take a look here at the French and Indian War. This is Fort Ticonderoga. At Fort Ticonderoga, David Worcester fights with the British. He's here with Jeffrey Amherst. And one of the things that he learns here at Ticonderoga is how to be a military leader. You cannot take thousands of men in the middle of nowhere and have them disciplined, have them know how to eat, know how to manage themselves daily, keep hygiene. You have to keep them disciplined. And David Worcester learns this while he is here at Fort Ticonderoga. He is in charge of a Grenadier Regiment, a Fusilier Regiment, Irish Regiment. This is really, really, really important. If we take a look at what he has at, at uh, Fort Ticonderoga, this is a copy of his orderly book, which is Tremendously awesome. I had this probably 13, 14 years ago. The Library of Congress has this document. It's a huge, big, left by 17, probably 70, 80 pages thing. I didn't even look at it. It's like, okay, that's neat. I'll look at it sometime. A couple summers ago, I plowed through it. Holy cow. First of all, David Worcester from Connecticut, this colonial, is the colonel of the day almost every day under Jeffrey Amherst that this book is written for. There are 47 court-martial cases in this book. 
These are rough. Where do you learn to be an officer? Where do you learn to be a soldier? Unless you are in the field with the best of the best. And a lot of people are like, man, this is really, this is really harsh. How do you keep the army together? George Washington had the very same problem when the revolution breaks out. How in the world do we fight the greatest army in the world with a bunch of hodgepodge militia guys that are going to go home in a month? And then I'm going to train new guys. It doesn't work. He knows it and Worcester knows it. One of these guys leaves to go home to see his mother. He's caught, brought back, and is given 25 lashes with a cat of nine tails. That's a deterrent. One guy runs away and is caught, strikes an officer. His punishment, these aren't punishments that Worcester gives. These are punishments that Worcester is writing about. And he's seen this. 1,500 lashes. He has marched to the head of Company A, where he has given 100 lashes in front of the whole company. Company B, 100 lashes, and so on and so forth. One guy deserted was caught in his French coat. And the selection says that he was court-martialed in his French coat. He was hanged by the neck in his French coat and buried face down in his French coat. You're out in the middle of nowhere. If you're not careful, disease is going to run rampant. If you don't, if you just let guys do what, well, if you're not careful, this is going to get really bad really fast. There are no hospitals down the road. If you have an, if you have an epidemic that sweeps through your camp, you're going to lose more than half your soldiers. You've got to keep them disciplined. And Worcester notes this. There's a kind of a funny little side note, and I put it in here. He puts kind of a one hat on one page. Uh, he made a mistake and lost his bed. So he puts a little hat, he says, Colonel Worcester having left a small bed, four blankets and a small bed quilt. A bolster and white pillows marked DW, all were in a canvas sack, and through a mistake were sent in a wrong bed to that's kind of a flat boat. Uh, to the canvas Lake George, therefore, whoever can and do inform of the same shall be well rewarded by David Worcester Colonel. Yeah, I put my sleeping bag on the wrong boat, and I don't, I don't know where it is. We never know if he gets it back, but we do know that when he dies, in his inventory is a bolster, pillows marked DW, and a folding camp bed. So I don't know if he bought another one or if this was the one, but just kind of a neat little aside that amidst all of the business of the day, oh, and by the way, if you see my bed, I, I do like your bed. <laughs> so there's just some letters here. I just want to see this. These are, these are some of the primary source letters that come from Connecticut, from the Connecticut Historical Society, uh, which, are, which are awesome just to see his writing. And with some of these, it's really neat to see how the letters are put together. There is no postage. Stamp, there is no envelope. If you look at this letter here, I was like, my students like, oh, is that blood? Oh, it's wax sealed. Because you can see here where this piece of paper is folded, all folded together. Oh, by the way, you're going to you're going home. Here's a letter. Take this to my wife and then drop it off for me, will you? That's how it works. And then if she has anything on the way, bring it bring it back with you too. There is no postal service. So think about all the orders and the military orders and letters to and from home are all being stuffed in some satchel and you know, to my wife in this little town or wherever, and away they go. But these letters are really, really neat to take a look at and really to understand his, his penmanship, how this. i got to put the microphone down for a minute because this is one of the biggest treasure troves I've ever run across. When you study the French Indian War into the American Revolution, there's always that question of, okay, you don't want to pay taxes. I got that. You get really, really mad, and you go to war, and you overthrow the government. There's, there's something missing there. It's not quite that easy. What is, what, what's the more, what's the other part of this? And I always would refer to David Worcester as the missing link in my class. Because here you've got a guy who's a devoted king and country, and all of a sudden, in a, in a short couple of years, he's got the blue wool coat on. What happens there? And I was doing some research, uh, and Yale University had this broadside. And I saw it was David Worcester copy. I'm like, oh, I've got to see this. So I emailed Yale, I'm like, can I please get a digital copy of this? Oh, I'm sorry. It's really, really fragile, and we can't. <laughs> or you know what I'm can, can you look at it for me and just write down everything's on it? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> you know, is there any way, please, that I can get a copy of this? I'm in Bob Burn, I'm teaching teachers. And all of a sudden, <coughs> an email pops up. I'm writing a little lecture, and it's over. And I screamed out loud, and it was like, you're right. And here, Yale had digitized it. So what this is, 
This is awesome. So first of all, here's a broadside, a big poster of all the things imported from India and England for the David Worcester Company. So if you take a look at this, it's written in 1773, which is right out here in the corner. And I have my students pull this apart. What are, and I love the one in the book, men's and women's worsted hose. When you have a high school senior boy that's like, okay, wait a minute. As far as you tell me, like, pantyhose? Like, what is that? You don't know. But really, really tall. So I can someone, by the way, you're going to wear a garter belt. Like, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> so when you, when you have them break these things down, what, what are they buying? And now, let's look at all those taxes of Parliament. And this is something that's very overshadowed. Let me just play the history teacher with you for just a minute. We often know the phrase, no taxation without representation. Everyone's heard that, right? That's totally wrong. The phrase should be no double taxation without representation. Let me explain that. Every one of us, if we were living in this area of Ohio in the 1750s, 60s, 70s, we would be Virginians. Our capital is in Williamsburg. So you can see the governor, you're getting on a horse, and about three weeks later, you're in the Chesapeake area to see the governor, okay? We all would pay taxes to the government in Williamsburg. Our elected legislators, we elected them. They are representing us. I got no problem paying taxes. I might not agree with all of it, but I know where it's going to go. After the French and Indian War, to relieve their 147 million pounds sterling debt, the Parliament levies an above and beyond layer of taxes. So you're paying Virginia, and now you're paying Parliament. And this is a double dipping. And so that's what's starting to make people really upset. And then you look at all of those taxes, and you can see them all listed here. One of the greatest ones I like to point out is in this row, right here, all of these iron, where German steel, nails, things like this, it was illegal to produce uh, usable steel or ironware in the colonies because of the Iron Act. We had to import all of our finished iron goods from England. So you start seeing we have to import these finished goods, and these finished goods, and these finished goods. And all of a sudden, all of these taxes and this issue starts to make some sense. But if you notice, this is two pages. I didn't ask for two pages. I asked for, I asked for this. So what, what is this? No one has ever read this before. It took me a month and a half to transcribe this document. There's a copy of it that's here. <laughs> so, so take a look at this. All right, imagine sitting down with a magnifying glass and, and reading these. It took a long time. This is the most awesome document I've ever read in my life. You want to know how intelligent this guy was? This is all about a land dispute between Connecticut and Pennsylvania, known as the Susquehanna Affair. If we had not gone to war with England in 1775, Pennsylvania and Connecticut would have been at war with each other. So what this really, really emphasizes is, we all look at the Schoolhouse Rock version, you know, the colonies, where they all like sing, hand, hold hands and sing kumbaya, they like each other. They didn't get along at all. Not at all. They had them and England. And here we have two neighbors saying, and Worcester goes through all of these charters of every king. And I'm sorry, if I'm reading this, Connecticut owns the land, has the right to the land, not Pennsylvania. And they are literally getting ready to fire at each other when the Revolutionary War breaks out. But what's interesting is if you look at it like this, it doesn't make any sense. So you take your folder, you fold it, and here is page one, two, three, and four. And if you look at it, you can see like that big loopy L. You can see it here right through on the front side. And it actually extends, the letter itself actually extends <coughs> to the top of this broadside copy, which is, which is powerfully awesome to take a look at. This, this, this guy is not stupid. He is, he is very, very, very smart. When royal George ruled o'er this land and loyalty That's my and for church and <laughs> king I made. Kind of a neat song. I, if we had more time, I would, I would play too. Now, here's one treasure trove number one. I told you about Phyllis Wheatley writing him. This is a handwritten copy 
of her letter to him in 1773. She has gorgeous handwriting. She really, really does. And what's really, really neat, young man, take a look at the bottom thing here. You see those wax seals? That's that's the back side of this page and how that letter was sent to him from England. There's no return, return address. There's no postage paid. It's a folded sheet of paper. I hope it gets to you. And this is the letter that she writes saying, please buy a copy of my poetry book and make sure the guys in Connecticut don't steal it and print it on their own. Very, very, very cool letter. I really like this. Um, right now I'm researching to try to get more to see if there are more Phyllis Wheatley letters. I'm contacting the, um, oh my gosh, this escaped me. It's in Massachusetts uh, where her letters are kept to see if there are any other correspondence between him and her. Because all of, again, all most of his letters are destroyed. So let's get into the American Revolution. It's 1775. I want you to look at this a minute. In 1775, when the war finally breaks out, David Worcester is already in battle. I know that a couple of you grabbed a copy of, of this, and you're more than welcome to take any of these you want. This is a school resource, because I kind of want people to know where is Worcester and where is Washington. Because we always assume that Washington rides up and he's on his white horse, waves his sword, the revolution begins, and away we go. April, May, and June. George Washington is at Mount Vernon. He is in Mount Vernon. He's in Philadelphia. He's in Congress. David Worcester is in Connecticut as a major general of the 1st Regiment of Connecticut Troops. He has planned, <clears throat> he has planned the assault on Fort Ticonderoga. You ever hear about David Worcester and Fort Ticonderoga? Who do you hear about taking Fort Ticonderoga? Anybody know? Do you know? You want to come here just with me? <laughs> oh, very well done. Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen. Benedict Arnold is from Connecticut. Benedict Arnold fights under David Worcester. David Worcester, when the Revolutionary War breaks out, is 65 years old. He is the oldest general officer in the American Revolution, with one exception, and that would be Seth Pomeroy, but Seth Pomeroy declined. So that makes David Worcester the oldest general officer in the American Revolution. Now, take a look at this a minute. What did I just say he was? In Connecticut, he's a major general, right? Where is he on the list up here? He's not even the first. He is the third brigadier assigned by the Continental Congress in 1775. So again, if you're like me and you're like, this guy's kind of cool, there's no ego here. Because he could have very easily said, I am a major general. I could sing that song by the way if you want me to. There. <laughs> but he doesn't. What does he do instead? He's like, I am here to serve. And he writes about this all the time. He takes a demotion in military rank to serve in this thing that is bizarre at best. No one's ever done this before. You want us all to cooperate and get along? You know, I'm sorry, but uh, two years ago I was writing that, that Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut are going to go to war. And now you want all of us to all get along and fight together against England? What? Oh, and by the way, 1775. <clears throat> We have like five guns, a rowboat, a couple horses, and a canoe. <laughs> Let's go take on the British Empire. All right? And so they have literally almost nothing. But what they do have is the militias in every one of the colonies that are very well disciplined and organized and structured. And Worcester's in charge of one of them. There was a letter, one of the letters I just got this summer is a bunch of men writing to the governor of Connecticut to write to their delegation in the Continental Congress saying that this is bogus. He should have never been made a Brigadier General. You, Governor, need to contact them and say he needs bumped up to Major General status, which he never is. So this is, but this is awesome stuff. When you look at where all of this is, where is he? 65. This guy, again, lawyer, merchant, long wharf, He's got, he's got everything half paid for life. He doesn't. He has everything to lose for the cause. And I want you to let that sink in. Here's a guy who truly has everything to lose. I'll pause with that for just a second. So let's take a look at the Revolutionary War with David Worcester uh, on the outset. 
So all the maps that you've been looking at, by the way, are all primary source maps. These are all original maps, either owned by David Lewis or, uh, or used in Connecticut. So in 1775, he's going from Oyster Pond to the area here, now New Haven to Oyster Pond. From Oyster Pond, he's going to move to New York. He's really, really preoccupied here in the, you know, the early months of, of 1775 with making sure that the British do not steal food, fodder, sheep, cattle, on Long Island or up into New York. And he's also in charge of making sure that New York is pretty well secured. We don't think about this, but how important it would be to make sure that you have food for your horses and your cattle, who literally are your buellers on the hoof that your <laughs> army must depend on. I mean, again, you talk to students like this, and they're like, well, let's go to the grocery get food. There aren't any. I mean, you are dependent upon everything, even feeding your beasts of burden. So truly, <laughs> hiding this stuff is important. David Wooster also, in New York, is looking for loyalists. There is an account in New York where his regiment sees the printing press of a loyalist in New York. They don't steal the press. They melt down all this type and make bullets out of it. But you got your press. You can press whatever you want. We're, we're taking the type. And they did uh, so there's early 1775. Now, let's take a look at a couple of letters of this guy. What's he writing about? What's he saying? And I love the fight between New York and Connecticut. They hate each other. And this is what was was saying to the governor. Your Honor, the governor, well knows the suspicious light in which the New York Congress are viewed by the rest of the continent. I must therefore beg of your Honor to alter that part of your orders to me in which you subject me to the direction of that body of men. I have no faith in their honesty in the cause, I must therefore think it not only a disgrace to me, but a dishonor to my employers, you governor, that I am subject to them. You know not, sir, half their tricks. I mean, you just imagine all of the politicking going on here. And, and there's, there's volumes of letters between him. I'm supposed to go to New York. I'm supposed to go back over here. New York wants me over here. Now the New York assembly wants me here. Where am I supposed to go? And whose orders am I under? Is it Connecticut, New York, or the Continental Congress? This is all very new and really very confusing as we take a look at this in early 1775. So now let's move into one of the biggest sections of Worcester's Revolutionary War experience, and that's the winter of 75 and 76 up at Quebec. Okay? So as I mentioned here, he is faced with a ton of challenges. No food, shortages, lack of supplies, the French Canadians aren't really cooperative very much, um, there's military defeats in Quebec, and You've got this political general who's doing everything in his power to stab you in the back and make you look stupid. So let's take a look at where he is. So here he is in <coughs> excuse me, New York. He's heading up the Hudson past Fort Ticonderoga, where, by the way, Philip Schuyler will be stationed because he is ill the entire campaign in Canada. He never takes the field to lead the men, and Philip Schuyler is in charge of all of this. So who takes the field? It is General Worcester and General Montgomery, who ends up here at Montreal. Worcester and Montgomery take Fort St. Jean, which is here in Canada, which Worcester gets a very lovely, praiseworthy letter from John Hancock congratulating him on taking this fort. And then they head up into the area of Upper Canada. Now you start to see some, and I could, we could do two hours just on Philip Schuyler and General Worcester. I'll give you just a sampling of the agitation between these two men. He's writing this to Philip Schuyler. I have the cause of my country too much at heart to attempt to make any difficulty or uneasiness in the army upon whom the success of an enterprise of almost infinite importance to the country is now dependent. I shall consider my rank in the army what my commission from the Continental Congress makes it and shall not attempt to dispute the command of General Montgomery and St. John's. As to my regiment, I consider them as what they really are, according to the tenor of their enlistments and compact of the colony of Connecticut, by whom they were raised, and now acting in conjunction with the troops of the other colonies in the service and for the defense of the associated colonies in general. There's a big argument as to who's really in charge here. It's a power play. What you see here in the winter is a tough fight. So here's an enlargement here. Worcester's at Montreal, General Montgomery is at Quebec, and then the northern commander is sick at Fort Ticonderoga, and will stay there for the entirety of this. 
In December of 1775, Worcester will receive word that the attack on Quebec was a failure. Not only is his colleague, General Montgomery, killed in battle, Benedict Arnold is wounded very badly. Now, all of this is up to him. He knows what he has to do, and this is really important. So look at this stuff here. There are two letters that David Worcester writes to the Continental Congress, and I think they are brilliant ideas. He said, listen, first of all, in 1775, we have a field order from General Washington that's sent to the Northern Army that listen, Guy Fawkes Day is coming up. Do not, do not, do not burn the Pope in effigy. You're going to really make the French Catholics, who we want to come in on our side, Good man. And this is a few order. Do not burn the Pope in effigy on Guy Fawkes Day. So they're very conscious of not making the French, who they want on their side, offended. So look what Lister suggests. Okay, how about this? If you want the French to be part of this, if you want Canada to be part of this, why don't you create two small continental congresses, one in Montreal, one in Quebec, let them have a say in it. Let them have representation. Let them have a voice in this. Okay? The other option is to pay. There is no money. And there is no Frenchman taking Continental Congress script anymore. Because it's worthless. You can blow your nose on it. And that's more valuable than what it's really worth. So Worcester says, I got an idea. Why don't you bring the settlers, those merchants, up to Canada? Let the French see the settlers being paid with Continental Congress paper money and Oh, these Americans are taking this money. Oh, we were supposed to be pretty good. So the French will naturally then go ahead and accept the paper currency. The French will know that when the suckers return to Philadelphia, the paper is returned and turned into hard currency, gold and silver. Pretty good idea, both of them. And the Continental Congress says no to both of them. And so here's Worcester left out here to deal with all of this stuff. So one of the things to take a look at with Worcester here in the Canadian campaign and this is really, really rough, is that he's here in the winter by himself, and he knows what needs to be done. The food is terrible. The food shortage is horrible. There is no ammunition. The disease is running rampant. Smallpox is devouring his camps. He is writing about this all the time, and he's writing to Congress saying, please send somebody up here to see the situation. We need to act on this now. Because if the river thaws, the British are going to reinforce Quebec and Montreal, and I have nothing to stop them. And he's spot on. And he writes about this from January on. He writes it constantly. We have no food. General Scott won't send me flour up to feed my men. We have no bread. We have no meat. The meaty sand was rotten. We have no ammunition. We have like four rounds per man. The Indians are now causing trouble. There are French priests who are causing trouble. They're cutting off the army supply lines. General Worcester sends prisoners to General uh, Schuyler for Ticonderoga, and General Schuyler lets him go. And General Worcester's like, I just sent this guy here. And he's like, he was okay. <laughs> All right, so it's like, I have no hair left after reading these letters because it's so frustrating. You can feel the tenor of these letters, like, what's going on here? The man is totally set up to fail, and he, and he, and he essentially does. In the spring, Congress does send a commission. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, Bishop John Carroll, who makes it most of the way. Franklin was supposed to go and got sick. And they get up here. And Samuel Chase of Maryland. They get up here and they're like, oh my gosh, there's no food. There's no ammunition. There's no bread. The river's going to fall. We're in bad shape. You, sir, are a disgrace. And they have Worcester recalled. And the letter from Charles Carroll is powerful. Interestingly enough, one of those other new letters I got, this summer was the journal of Bishop John Carroll, who says, oh, by the way, on our way up here, guess what? We stopped and we visited General Schuyler for a while. Then we went up to Quebec and we were met with Benedict Arnold. Then we went and finally saw General Worcester after all of that priming of the pump before we got up there. And he is recalled, and Worcester has to return. So we'll go through this because we're running out of time, getting a little short here. But I want to wrap up the end of this. Um, and Worcester goes. Worcester has to go back, and he follows orders. He's a soldier. So what does Worcester do? He goes from the Canadian campaign. He goes south to New York, where General Washington is. This is prior to the Declaration being written. This is prior to the debacle of the summer and fall New York campaign, where General Washington is driven all the way through and then over to 
Trenton, the battle of Trenton at the end of the, the, end of the year. So we're not, we're not doing so good. While he is visiting with General Washington, he asks General Washington's permission to go to Philadelphia and defend his cause and his men. That was first. That actually was his men and my reputation. And Washington says yes. So Washington allows David Wooster to go to Philadelphia. He is in Philadelphia, super cool, over the 4th of July, when the Declaration is finally adopted by the Continental Congress. So he's there. And then he goes back home. And he ends up going all the way back to Connecticut. By the end of 1776, he has written the Continental Congress three times. Oh, by the way, they totally exonerated him of any wrongdoing whatsoever in Canada. John Adams' diary makes a note of this, where John Adams says, there is a powerfully vicious anti-New England sentiment in the Continental Congress, and General David Wooster was the scapegoat of this. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so the guy's exonerated. It's clean slate. He's still a Brigadier General. He writes them three times. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm available. I, I'm not doing anything. They never, ever, ever again give David Worcester the Continental Congress Commission. So somebody asked me later, well, does that mean that he was just done and tired? He's an old man, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm going to go home. What's he do? He goes back to Connecticut, and the governor appoints him again as Major General, and he fights again. So this guy's not done. He has a cause to fight for. And this is a letter then to John Hancock where that quote comes from, which is very, very powerful. So this, this letter about honor and virtue comes at the lowest ebb of his military career. Where he says, listen, I'm not here to play games. I'm here for the cause. And the cause is worth every penny of this sacrifice. So as he goes through this, as we get into the end here, and I hate to tell you this, but we're going really close to being done. Because in 1777, General Worcester is killed in battle. So in the spring of 1777, David Worcester is here at Rye Neck, going back and forth to New York, kind of you know, jockeying those two positions. Word reaches him that the British Tory governor of New York is raiding into Connecticut. So he rallies up as many troops as he can, along with Benedict Arnold. Now, Benedict Arnold is 35 years younger than David Worcester. Washington is 22 years younger than Washington. He's kind of that same demo. By the way, both Washington and Worcester were 67 when they died. All right, so here he is in Danbury, at New Haven, at the Battle of Ridgefield in April of 1777, while David Worcester is on his horseback, rallying troops, and they are doing a decent job of driving this British detachment out of Danbury, who is there to destroy and pillage. As he turns in his saddle, he is struck in the side by an enemy ball, which shatters his spine and lodges itself in the side, and he falls out of his saddle. Now, if you look at the images of Worcester, you'll see on the statue here and his portrait that he has on a waist sash. Now, the waist sashes are not just uh, for nice decoration, and they're, they're for easy finding of officers in the field. They do kind of hold the girth in a little bit. I should have my mind tonight. Um, but they're more importantly used as a stretcher. And David Worcester's was made of silk, and I have one that's really kind of cool. It opens up, and you can literally carry a body off the field in this waist sash. David Worcester is born off the field quickly. <clears throat> he dies three days later. His wife and oldest son are there. And then he's buried because the British are still present. And after his death, this is the other letter from Phyllis Wheatley. This is the one that is the letter. All of this here is the eulogy poem in honor of General David Worcester, written by Phyllis Wheatley. This whole part here, I received your favor by uh, Mr. Dennison including a paper in which indicated the character of the truly worthy General Worcester. And it's a, it's a extremely heartfelt letter, and it's a really awesome poem to take a look at. This will be read, by the way, when we dedicate the statue uh, next year, which, is, which it should be. Um, when David Worcester dies, here is a portrait, the only portrait of the death of Worcester, which is in the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee suite in the Capitol building. Above it's a great big archway here above the big door by Constantino Blumini, the Italian painter, and it shows Worcester B 
being carried off the field in his stretcher. But he's got to be very fast. And he is. In the 1820s, after everything's really pretty well calmed down, the War of 1812 was long past, we're, we're kind of getting back on our feet. Somebody says, hey, remember, remember our guy? Where is, where is Mr. Berry? Oh, he remembers. And in the back of the room is a very elderly, very tall black man. As I remember, I buried him when I was a little boy. Okay, and he takes them to the spot. They exhume a body. It is a military uniform, old epaulets, shattered spine, and ball located where the stomach would be. They exhume the body, and David Worcester is currently, hopefully permanently, buried in Danbury Cemetery. And that obelisk there is where you can find him today. And I hate to tell you this, but do you think that the people in Connecticut who have this American hero with them? Several years ago, I drove out to Boston and I did a presentation to a bunch of teachers, and so, so we drove, uh, because I wanted to see all these things, and my wife, God bless my wife, every exit once you get past Philadelphia is something related to the revolution, and how I didn't run us off the road, or get us killed, that was right, keep your eyes on the road. Uh, but we, we called here, because I wanted to see this, and I called the cemetery, I knew it was in the cemetery in Danbury, and I called, and I called the cemeteries, asking for somebody, like, is, is this person there? Kind of an odd question, I understand. But I wanted to know where I could find his, his monument. Nobody knew what he was talking about. And I kind of, the phone was kind of put down off the side. You, know, you hear the conversation, you know about huh? younger people. And all of a sudden, I hear an elderly woman in the background say, Give me the phone. Give me the phone. That's so why I'm talking to this lady. She's like, Are you looking for General Wilson? I said, Yes, ma'am. Well, you need to go here, 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 and turn here, and he's right up in the right one cell. And everyone I can hear in the background, Oh, that's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of interesting. On the one side is a bas relief of, of him being shot as horse. One side is a mason mark. One is the memorial crest, which, by the way, these flags are replicas of his. This is for the First Regiment of Connecticut troops. This is the memorial crest of Connecticut on one side, and the motto for Massachusetts on the other. So when these men went to war in 1775. They were fighting alongside their brethren in Massachusetts. Uh, he, he had a yellow one, Rufus Putnam had a red one. There were three or four different ones. And that's the same size as the original one would have been. So this is it. So what do we have with David Worcester now? This is the only statue of David Worcester anywhere, everywhere, period. And it's a very kind of interesting, unique, you know, it's 30 feet up on the west facade of the State House in Hartford, which is like way over on this corner by all these trees. So if you look at the, the State Pillar House, it's full of all these great men and women of Connecticut history. It's very, very cool. That's it. I mean, I'm not, it's kind of Revolutionary War. I guess if you're looking at it 30 feet up, I can say, okay, and his name's that. That's cool. But that's it. So let's get back to our point. Why here? Why our guy here? Why Worcester, Ohio? After the American Revolution, in the 1780s, well, I actually say in 1780 and 81, Ben and Darnold comes back after a little uh, excursion to the British, the dark side. <laughs> uh, so he goes on to uh, fight with the British, and one of the first things he does is attacks and raids the coast of Connecticut, his home colony, in which he burns it to the ground, including Worcester's home and the mercantile business. He then attacks and invades the coast of Virginia and does the same thing. Um, a lot of the men and women who lived on the coast of Connecticut lost everything. And if you know much, we are a little bit south. Akron is, is more on the long line of the southern border of the Firelands. All of this northwestern or northeastern Ohio, the western reserve of Connecticut is out here. That was land given to those men and women who lost everything at the end of the war in Connecticut. And so a lot of those guys come out here and kind of ease their way, ooze their way, creep their way south into where we are. Doing some research on these guys, I want to get this really, really well down. There are 51 Revolutionary War veterans buried in Wayne County that we know of that are documented. Okay? Of those 51, 30 some from Connecticut. There's a gentleman that's buried in the Fredericksburg Cemetery who lived in New Haven and was David Wooster's neighbor. These people knew him. So here they are, they're out in Wayne County. 
named after Anthony Wayne, as many of our counties are named after, Revolutionary War uh, generals and, and admirals and captains, and we have a bunch of really, really cool guys. But no county has been named the county seat in honor of a general of the Revolution. 32 years after David Worcester is killed in 1777, these men get together somehow, some way, and name this city after this man, their man. And I really want to make this important. I really, really want to stress this. Like, I can't say this enough. It's not just that guy's a soldier. If you take a look at the Declaration of Independence that I love, and you look at the ideals in the Declaration, ideas of life, and liberty, equality, property from which comes happiness, David Worcester talks about this stuff. He talks about fighting for liberty and freedom and independence. He talks about equality. And not only does he talk about it, he acts on it. I don't see too many of the other founders who are writing letters to free black men or women. He does. And when you look at how important this guy is to us now, almost 310 years later, this guy's character his fortitude, his ideals, his leadership. This is our heritage. This is, this is ours. And that's what makes this whole project I've been working on for a year or so so cool. And I never get tired of it. I mean, you, you, get, you get impassioned by this. I've given this talk 21 times, and I'll give it 210 more times if I need to. This is cool stuff, and we need to get this. In our day and age, I think we've, we've totally lost connection with where we come from. We lose track of those ideals of equality and defending equality and liberty and independence and all of that stuff that comes with it. It's not easy. And this guy here is a tremendous role model to me because he loses everything. Everything for this cause. The final letter of this chapter, which I'm digging into hardcore this, this fall and winter, he's dead. There's a letter from Mary Worcester, Lady Worcester, to President Washington, 1789. And my students just read this letter. It was President, you remember my husband, he fought with you in the revolution. My son is leaving me to go to Europe. If he leaves me, I am destitute because I cannot claim the military pension from my husband. I have no money. Dear Mr. President, would you please adopt my son and give him a job? And the response letter to Lady Washington from the President, which is very sad, Lady Worcester, my heart goes out to you as President of the United States. There is nothing I can do in this capacity to help you. The last we have in this train is about an 1801 Act of Congress this goes through the presidency of Adams and Jefferson. Hamilton's involved in this, trying to get Lady Worcester, her husband's pension, with interest. And I lose it. I don't know. She died in 1807. I have no idea if she ever claimed. Oh, and by the way, all that money that the Worcesters paid during the war, they never could be reimbursed for because, oh, sorry, no receipt? I wish I could trust you. Sorry, not there. Because it's all destroyed. So this guy is awesome. And we owe it. Over 200 years ago, these men who lived in the county honored this man by naming this city for him. Now it's our turn to return that, return to our heritage, and have the first bronze statue of General Worcester in the entire world right out front of this library. And as you guys go out and take a look at the really cool stained glass window before you leave, go around the corner there, the bronze maquette, the 18 inch maquette is right there in the display case. It is awesome. And I will tell you this before I give up the microphone, that the sculptor is already started on the life size. He can't wait to get started on it. And the fundraising, I'll be honest with you, is going slow. And I'm an impatient man. And I want this statue up next spring. If it's not up sometime next year, I'm going to be really, really, really disappointed. So I told my wife, we're going to fly and rob a bank or something. <laughs> um, but we're working on it really, really hard. So on the handouts that I gave you tonight, one of them, uh, is the, was the timeline of Worcester's life. I hope you appreciate that, like that. The other is a little bit of a flyer. On one side is a website. 
that I've been giving out to teachers as I talk to the Worcester City School teachers in August to help them teach about Worcester in the classrooms. Um, and it's, you know, the website is packed full of information. The other side is the information where everyone can donate to the Wayne County Community Foundation, tax exempt, for this great project. And we're getting there. And I'll be honest with you, we keep getting there. <laughs> so anything that you could do individually, your businesses, friends that you know, get the word passed around because it's awesome, awesome stuff. And I believe I am out of time. So should I pass the, ask for questions? Ma'am? We just sent a check to Alan Cottrell, the sculptor. Uh, we have raised uh, $26,665 so far. The statue itself will cost $64,000 for the statue. Then there's also a component built in for uh, longevity. So there will be a portion of it saved in the community foundation if the statue is repaired or anything of that nature that it will not cost the library or the friends of the library or anybody anything. So that's built into the budget. Do you have the city of Worcester decided to name us after General Taylor Worcester? Well, and that was, that was the, those Revolutionary War veterans who lived in the area that, like, that's our guy. And it's time to do that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'll take a look and see the, the document I was looking off of is compiled by the Veterans Services over here on the side of town. And there, there's dozens and dozens of cemeteries in there. I'll look and see if that's one that's listed. Um, but the more you look, the more they're all over the place, which yeah. is very, very cool. Do we know anything about the family name Worcester and where it came from? It's English. They're from England. They're here for about two generations. Father <coughs> is, is here. Um, I will tell you this, that helping out with some genealogy, our commissioner, Becky Foster, who is a Worcester, is related to General Worcester. I helped her find that out. So her direct line of and over fought brothers, or they were brothers, and then his kid. Uh, we do, yeah, that's all recorded. I don't, I don't know. I can make something up really good, but you know, <laughs> we do, we do have that. That is, that's been safe. Is there yeah. a connection with uh, General Redson Bell? No, he comes later, and that's an interesting point. The guys that we think of, the Larwells, the Bells, the Beavers, those come that next generation. They're, they're so those guys, that, and that was often the thought. Which one of them? Name the city for this. None of them. It was already here. And it was those other guys that were living in the county before those guys were out here to survey and, and get that going. Yes, ma'am. There's a street in Willow, Manhattan called Worcester. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? It's the same, it's the same guy. Uh, but there's a Worcester, in, there's a lot of Worcesters in um, Connecticut. And we were just in Marietta a couple weekends ago, and there's a Worcester Street in Marietta because Rufus put them. Who starts that is from Canada. So when you start looking, it's like, this is really cool.